and computer models have long suggested climate change is making these storms more intense and destructive. So hurricanes are becoming wetter because the oceans simultaneously interact with the atmosphere. Sea surface temperature can also have profound effects on global climate. Increases in sea surface temperature have led to an increase in the amount of atmospheric water vapor over the oceans. This water vapor feeds weather systems that produce precipitation, increasing the risk of heavy rain. In fact, every degree Celsius of warming allows the air to hold about 7% more water. And this is extremely significant, meaning we can definitely expect future storms to unleash higher amounts of rainfall. Flooding within itself is an extreme weather event. And when we look at Tropical Storm Grace in August of 2001, Trinidad, Haiti, and Jamaica were all impacted. In Trinidad, Tropical Storm Grace led to one person dying as a result of a landslide destroying their home. In Jamaica, there were 13 incidents of flooding on the island and two landslides, most in the parish of St. Andrews. Haiti had severe flooding in certain communities, and truthfully, the timing couldn't be worse for our Haitian brothers and sisters who are already under huge strain, as hundreds of thousands have been left struggling for food, water, or shelter after that 7.2 magnitude earthquake on August 14th. Unfortunately, not only is climate change making the strongest hurricane stronger, it is also making them dangerously, rapidly intensifying hurricanes, like Hurricane Michael, Harvey, and Dorian. Rapid intensification requires three components. One, you need an increase in wind speeds of at least 35 miles per hour in a 24 hour period, extremely warm wet water, and wind shear and dry air. Dorian did this in a space of just nine hours, a rate of intensification never seen before. Rapidly intensifying hurricanes that strengthen just before landfall are among the most dangerous storms as they can catch forecasters and populations off guard, risking inadequate evacuation efforts and large casualties. A particular concern is that intensification rate increases are not linear as the intensity of a storm increases. They increase by the square power of the intensity. If we take a look at history, the lack of warning and rapid intensification just before landfall were key reasons for the high death toll in the 1935 Labor Day hurricane in the Florida Keys. The storm intensified with 80 miles per hour in 24 hours just before landfall, topping out at a category five system with 185 miles per hour. And in its track, we lost 408 people, making it the eighth deadliest hurricane in US history. Kerry Emanuel, an MIT hurricane scientist, research has indicated if we continue business as usual with our approach to climate change, which, are, which is our current trajectory, the odds of a hurricane intensifying by 70 miles per hour or more in 24 hours just before landfall were about one every 100 years in the climate of the late 20th century. For the climate of the year 2100, these odds increased to one in every five to 10 years. So no longer is Dorian a storm that you will see once every blue moon, it will become more frequent. So now that we have a foundation, let us now look at identifying short-term and long-term health threats to patients impacted by extreme weather events and steps that health professionals can take to reduce these risks. Climate change fueled acute disaster events are causing negative impacts on human health. Long-term climate change leads to temperature-related illness and mortality, spread of vector-borne disease, respiratory issues, and allergic response, compromised fetal and child development, and threats to water and food supply and safety, which are among other impacts. Knowledge of the human health impacts of climate change allow us to learn about the interconnected relationship of physical, mental, and community health and well-being. Comprised, compromised, sorry, physical health can be a source of stress that threatens psychological well-being. Mental health problems can threaten physical health, such as weakening the immune system. Community health and well being are interconnected with both, and structural and systemic inequity and disinvestment shape all forms. So, when we look at physical injuries, direct health effects of hurricanes stem from direct wind force, damaged infrastructure, and flooding. Unintentional injuries are most common 
among the direct health effects of hurricanes, drowning, poisoning, electrocution, and injuries from restoration efforts are some of the common reasons underlying unintentional injuries. The most common types were are abrasions, lacerations, cuts caused by falls, slips, trips, and being hit by or on from another object. And these pictures in this diagram are actually some of the injuries that I saw during Hurricane Dorian. And so Hurricane Dorian definitely matched what is found in the research. And when I think about unintentional injuries associate, associated with Hurricane Dorian, I often think back to Eric the Barber and his story made international headlines. After his home was compromised, he and his family tried to escape and his outstretched left arm was sliced off by plywood while he clung to his elderly mother in Hurricane Dorian's surging waters, sending his limb and his mom out to sea. And that is tragic. Psychological consequences associated with extreme weather events are widespread and pervasive. Human beings are very visual people. And what I mean by this is that we often place greatest emphasis on what we can't see, which would be medical trauma and injuries. However, research has shown that in a disaster the size of the psychological footprint greatly exceeds the size of the medical footprint. And that was certainly the case in Hurricane Dorian. Psychological repercussions may occur for persons far from the scene who are socially connected to direct victims of the disaster. So following a disaster, persons who may need psychological support tend to be larger in number and geographically more dispersed than persons sustaining harm at the epicenter of destruction. Almost everyone exposed to disaster experiences fear and distress. This is acceptable and, and truthfully a universal reaction. Many who are initially affected will rebound rapidly and regain full functioning without need for intervention. However, some disaster exposed persons will exhibit detrimental behavior changes, such as when unharmed but fearful citizens converge on area hospitals. A smaller proportion of persons, especially those with the most intense exposure, will experience more pronounced psychological consequences leading to diagnoses such as post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, general anxiety, to name a few. Persons who have lost a loved one are likely to experience traumatic bereavement or complicated grief. There are individual differences, but a general rule of thumb is that the intensity of exposure to the disaster event predicts where disaster survivors fall along this continuum of transient distress, the psychopathology. While the exposure to disaster hazards during impact may be relatively brief, hardships in the aftermath associated with the losses, lifestyle changes, and socio-ecological disruptions often persist for extended periods of time. Accordingly, psychological stress is maintained even after physical forces have ceased to do harm. Disaster survivors who have lost loved ones must cope with tasks of disaster recovery and reconstruction while grappling with traumatic bereavement and often with prolonged grief disorder. When thinking of mental health solutions, I had the opportunity to be a part of an amazing cadre of authors who wrote an article entitled Scrambling in the Eye of Dorian, Mental Health Consequences of Exposure to a Climate-Driven Hurricane. Five of the authors were physicians that work in the Bahamas. Myself, my wife, Dr. Nadia Holder Hamilton, who was with me on the front lines during the passage of Hurricane Dorian, Dr. Dwayne Sands, Dr. Sandeep Goud, and Dr. Krista Nordich. We also had a well-experienced international lineup with our senior author being Dr. Sandra Galea, followed with Dr. James Schultz, Dr. James Coulson, Dr. Zelda Espinel, Dr. Stephanie Friedman, and last but not least, Mr. Craig Fugate. Our paper looked at the mental health consequences of exposure to a climate-driven hurricane, and research has shown that most nations lack trained mental health professionals and a lack structure for delivering evidence-based mental health and psychosocial support interventions when large populations are exposed to extreme events. This has become glaringly apparent as of 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic has multiplied the prevalence of depression and anxiety disorders. Fortunately, there are comprehensive systems devised by the WHO for delivering mental health 
and psychosocial support interventions after disasters that are applicable to hurricane affected communities worldwide. So conducting outreach surveillance and screening. Many residents evacuate or are displaced because of storm damage. Others who remain are not regular patients of the clinic. Therefore, storm related mental disorders may go undetected and untreated. Storm affected communities may consider initiating active outreach and conducting public health surveillance throughout the recovery phase as residents return and repopulate the community. Surveillance can be conducted at the household level, assessing basic needs as well as physical and mental health status. Using mobile teams of community health workers or other paraprofessionals may be a viable option. Adult and child storm survivors should be screened for common mental disorders because each storm has individual distinguishing features, which is important to relate to psychiatric symptoms and assess on interview and clinical scales. When we look at using task sharing to expand capacity, given the pervasiveness of psychological stress and distress after disasters, mental health professionals on site often lack sufficient capacity to meet the full range of population needs. In these situations, task sharing can be beneficial. Through this process, some of the tasks that would otherwise be, be performed by mental health professionals with advanced credentials can be redistributed among the ranks of available healthcare workers. For example, mental health professionals can train power professionals as staff extenders to provide psychoeducation in community venues and deliver evidence-based interventions with professional supervision for survivors with elevated symptom levels identified through screening. Also, you can adapt WHO resources and evidence-based interventions. And then finally, it's important that we reestablish care for people with serious and persistent mental illness. I've also placed a case study on the screen that the Ministry of Health and Wellness in the Bahamas undertook as a result of Hurricane Dorian. And it is commendable that over the period they were able to treat 3,000 children and 3,000 adults via face-to-face -face telepsychology using the MHPSS uh, roller from the WHO. Climate change will affect human health and well-being in a variety of direct and indirect ways, depending on exposure to hazards and vulnerabilities that are heterogeneous and vary within societies influenced by social and economic and geographical factors, as well as individual differences. So for the context of this presentation, our hazard is an acute event, a hurricane. Vulnerabilities can be broken down into physiological factors and social factors. Exposures can be direct, indirect, or vicarious. So direct exposure is somebody who is at ground zero. Indirect exposure, can be persons who are displaced or had to relocate due to the hurricane. And vicarious exposure are those friends and families that suffer as, a, as of a result of knowing that their loved ones have been through such a tragedy. Key adaptation responses, which can be skilled if we look at it from an institutional level. Government can enhance locally based and culturally relevant mental health services, inform policies and early intervention. From, from a community standpoint, there can be community planning and design for current and future climate risk, increased climate informed wellness programming, and climate focuses training for health providers such as this forum today. On an individual basis, the adaptation response can be to continue to raise awareness, focus on preparedness, being more proactive than reactive, and seeking out mental health support. Climate change risk to mental health and well being can be categorized into three areas mental illness, such as PTSD and anxiety, diminished well being, examples can be stress or sadness, and then you can have diminished social relation, such as domestic violence. Any chronic medical condition can be exacerbated in a disaster due to stress of the event, loss of physical support systems, lack of access to medication. And or, and or loss of access to equipment or systems needed to support daily medical care. On this slide, I have highlighted several vulnerable population subsets. As healthcare providers, there are several ways we can encourage our patients, encourage them to heed evacuation warnings, 
We will talk later about public health communications, but I just want to mention here that in, our, in the region, many of our countries are small island masses surrounded by water. Unfortunately, you don't have the benefit or option of driving from Florida to New York or to Los Angeles to escape the storm. Some of our larger island states, such as Cuba, Hispaniola, and Jamaica, depending on the magnitude and track of the storm, may have an opportunity to move further inland. A consideration for our dialysis patients can be to consider peritoneal dialysis. In any disaster, hemodialysis for maintenance dialysis patients may be impacted due to loss of power, inadequate supply of clean water, staff or disposable equipment shortages and disruption of transportation. As a result, some of the literature has suggested that peritoneal dial dialysis is a better option in a disaster prone region. And if we have any nephrologists on this evening, I would love to get your input on this. The three-day diet emergency kits. In any emergency or disaster situation, you should do everything you can to get regular dialysis treatment. In any emergency, follow the three-day emergency diet plan until you can get the treatment needed. You should always try to get dialysis within three days of your last treatment. Diabetes is one of the major CNCDs we face in the region, and it's important that our diabetics have a disaster preparedness plan, which include checklists of supplies, information, and guidelines, ensuring that they have enough syringes, lancets, glucometers are all important. And then last but not least, trying to ensure that you have enough medication. So depending on your condition, when you visit your primary care provider, if you are stable, then your provider may consider giving you prescriptions with either three months, even up to six months set of refills on it. So as a hurricane is approaching, there are practices that encourage patients to get an additional supply of medication in the event that the hospital, pharmacy, or clinic is destroyed. The patient will still have medication until the all clear is given and access to medication is resumed. This was implemented in Dorian and based off of observation, there are patients when they arrived at the clinic had their medication. On the other hand, those that did not, we saw elevated glucose readings, elevated blood pressure readings that required management. And so imagine now handling a storm and your clinic being turned into a shelter for over 1500 persons that's, that it was not designated to become. Imagine trying to maneuver and give care to all these critical patients moving through 1,500 persons. It was indeed a challenging time for all of us. This flowchart gives us a systematic way to think about health outcomes that can occur through multiple pathways, including hazards from ex exposure to storm impact, evacuation, post-storm hazards from utility outages and sheltering in place in inadequate housing, exposure to secondary hazards, including contaminated drinking water, contact with contaminated floodwaters, and mold and moisture in housing, population displacement and disruption of services, mental health effects from traumatic or stressful experiences during and after the storm, and health and safety risk from cleanup and recovery activities. So let's switch gears and look at disaster risk reduction which is aimed at preventing new and reducing existing disaster risk and managing residual risks, all of which contribute to strengthening resilience and therefore to achievement of sustainable development. Disaster reduction is not a new concept, but rather a new priority. We must take a more proactive instead of reactive approach to disasters. Most injuries and death happen during the impact of the storm and the most vulnerable among us are greatly impacted. So when we look at the Hospital Safety Index, which was a tool developed by the Pan-American Health Organization and a group of Caribbean and Latin American experts, it is being widely used by health authorities to gauge the overall level of safety of a hospital or health facility in emergency situations. This reality poses a significant threat to health facilities in the Caribbean. When 38 hospitals in the English-speaking Caribbean were assessed, 82% fell into category B. Measures are required in the short term to reduce losses. And 18% fell into category C. Urgent me measures are required to protect the life of patients and staff. Weakness in both functional and non-structural issues tended to be the predominant cause of increased vulnerability. 40% of the assessed facilities took some measures to improve their safety score, which is great. 
The Smart Hospital Initiative builds on the Safe Hospital Initiative and focuses on improving hospitals' resilience, strengthening structural and operational aspects, and providing green technologies. Smart hospitals have already shown their cost effectiveness and resilience to disasters in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Georgetown Hospital was the only one that remained functional after a severe storm affected 39 clinics and the reference hospital. In addition, this hospital became a water supply center for the community after the storm using their rainwater reserves. So a smart hospital must have the following three components. Resiliency, meaning that it is safe. Sustainability, meaning that it is smart. Environmentally sound, meaning that it is green. So when we look at the WHO's Health Emergency and Disaster Rich manage Management Framework, this provides a common language and a comprehensive approach that can be adapted and applied by all actors in health and other sectors while working to reduce health risks and consequences of emergencies and disasters. The framework also focuses on improving health outcomes and well being for communities at risk in different contexts. And when we look at the guiding principles of the health EDRM, we see that there are six principles risk based approach, comprehensive management, and all hazards approach, inclusive people and community centered approach, multi sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration, and a whole of system based approach. And I just want to highlight the inclusive people and community-centered approach. Community members are central to an effective health EDRM, as it is their health, livelihoods, and assets that are at risk of any hazardous event, including emergencies and disasters. They are often well-placed to manage their own risk through actions that provide protection to themselves, their families, and communities, and are often first responders to an emergency. At the end of the day, health emergency and disaster risk management is everybody's business, not just the government, not just healthcare workers, but everyone. And so we'll, we'll have our second Zoom poll question. When would be the best time to communicate a hurricane message? Is it A, pre-season, pre-impact, C, impact, or D, post-impact? And the polls are in. And again, we have an amazing bunch this evening. And 84% said preseason, which is absolutely correct. And so let's switch gears and talk about public health communication. Public health communication is the development, dissemination, and evaluation of relevant, accurate, accessible, and understandable information shared with and received from intended audiences to protect and advance the health of the public. So there are seven things to consider when communicating about health. First of all, trust. Will the people trust the information? Who is the best source to put the information out? Information, what information is necessary and how will people perceive the information? Is it too much or too little information? Motivation, how relevant is the information to the people you're trying to reach? The environment. What are the conditions that surround and affect the audience? Capacity. What is the people's ability to act on the information? Are there any barriers? Perception. What will the audience think about the information and what will inspire them to act? And finally, the response. How will people respond? What can we do to stay engaged with them and give them the support as they take action? So when we look at hurricane communications, as healthcare providers, when we think of our patient interaction, the majority of our time is spent speaking with patients, beginning with a detailed history and ending with counseling the patient on their diagnosis. In medical school, our consultants will always say the diagnosis is in the history. I give that preamble to say that the right message at the right time from the right person can save a life. 
every natural disaster is unique and emergency responders have to quickly adapt to the ever-changing nature of a crisis to be able to more quickly and effectively disseminate messages before, during, and after emergency. Many key messages can be written in the preparedness phase. As it relates to hurricanes, there are several areas that clear communication need to be given, and these are those listed on the screen. So let us take a closer look at some of them. Preparation is key, and it takes on many forms. Make a plan, even if there's no risk of hurricane. Make sure you and your family are prepared. The best time is to prepare is not when the storm is on top of you. You should not be scrambling looking for essentials. A few pointers that you can also share with in your networks. Stock upon emergency supplies for your home and your car. Write down emergency phone numbers. Buy a fire extinguisher. Find out where the nearest shelter may be. Make sure that everyone in your family knows what warning sirens sound like in your area and what to do when they go off. Prepare emergency food and water supplies. So non-perishable food items are ideal. And we should store at least one gallon of water per day for each person and each pet within your household. Gather your safety and personal care products such as medications, uh, personal toiletry products. And then you would also want to get your home ready for the storm. And that entails cleaning of the yard, removing anything that can be used as a missile, such as lawn furniture, propane tanks, use storm shelters or nail pieces of plywood to the windows to avoid the windows being shattered. Even you must prepare the car, fill the car with gas, make sure you have an emergency kit in the car as well, and make sure you have things such as flares, jumper cables, maps, GPS, and then whether to evacuate or stay at home. If a hurricane or severe flooding is coming, you may hear an order to evacuate. Please leave your home. Do not ignore that order. Even sturdy, well-built houses may not hold up against an extreme storm with a strong wind and high water. Staying home to protect your property is not worth risking your health and safety. You may also hear an order to stay at home. Sometimes staying at home is safer than leaving. We also need to look at preventing illness. And as healthcare providers, this is where we can spend further time counseling on things such as food, water safety, diarrheal diseases, making sure that they're getting the tetanus vaccines on time, wound infections, food and water after a storm, and staying safe in shelters or in crowded living conditions. Vectorball illnesses are also a concern that need to be communicated. When we look at vectorball illnesses and hurricanes, an increase in mosquitoes is a natural occurrence following a hurricane. Adult mosquitoes do not generally survive high winds during hurricane. Immediate following a hurricane, flooding may occur, so eggs are laid, resulting in a very large population of floodwater mosquitoes. Most of the mosquitoes are considered nuisance mosquitoes as they don't generally spread any viruses that make people sick. However, in our region, we have to be mindful of the Aedes aegypti mosquito that is known to carry Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya. And so how do we prevent mosquito bites? First of all, we can wear long clothing. Secondly, we can spray insect rep repellents. And thirdly, remember to turn over any flower pots removal any old tires out of the yard, because all of these serve as breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Early warning systems. These are widely considered to be one of the most important mechanisms to prevent disasters around the globe. The United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction defines early warning systems as the provision of timely and effective information through identified institutions that allows individuals exposed to a hazard to take action to to avoid or reduce their risk and prepare for effective response. Effective early warning systems may include four interrelated key elements. First, disaster risk knowledge based on systematic collection of data and disaster risk assessments. Two, detection, monitoring, analysis, and forecasting of the hazards and possible consequences. Three, dissemination and communication by an official source of authoritative, timely, accurate, and actionable warnings 
and associated information on likelihood and impact. And four, preparedness at all levels to respond to the warnings received. The questions in each section are very practical, which provides a framework or template of sorts to ensure that you're capturing the necessary information. These four interrelated components need to be coordinated within and across sectors and multiple levels for the system to work effectively and to include a feedback mechanism for continuous improvement. Failure in one component or a lack of coordination across the system will cause failure. So let's look at a case study. We have a 66-year-old male, known hypertensive chronic smoker, who sought medical care at a hospital due to severe chest pain. The pain is described as a weight on the chest, eight out of 10 pain severity radiating down the left arm. Vital signs are within normal limits. The examination was pretty good, except that he had a systolic murmur. Investigations were done, and of importance, he had an ECG done twice that showed ST elevations. So I hope everybody's thinking along the lines of an acute myocardial infarction, which is known as a heart attack. Immediate medical intervention, preferably within the first hour of onset of symptoms is aimed at quickly restoring blood flow to the heart muscle to prevent or minimize this damage. Many hospitals have a STEMI code team who are on standby in the ED once the patient arrives for effective and efficient care. In centers that have a cath lab, Primary percutaneous coronary intervention is the gold standard for these patients with a recommended dot for long time of less than 90 minutes. So in the context of this presentation, as we speak about hurricanes, early warning systems can alert local communities on things like approaching hurricanes, cyclones, where getting ahead of these extreme weather events, even by a few hours, can make all the difference. So having an early warning system equals the ability to prepare and again, can equal a result of a life saved. So let's break down Hurricane Katrina. What went wrong? Was an early system, early warning system in place? We spoke early on the four elements that make up a complete early warning system. In the case of Katrina, a technical monitoring and warning was nearly perfect. The projected path was exact and the predicted windstorm and storm surge was extremely accurate. The dissemination of warning was also excellent and done in a timely manner. Most people must have prior knowledge of the hurricane risk in the area as hurricanes frequently approach the region. Therefore, timely warning made about 1 million people evacuate from the region. It can be said then that the problem lied in the fourth component, response capability, knowledge by people of how to react and the capacity to do so. Despite mandatory evacuations ordered, there were persons that did not evacuate. And these persons are mainly socially vulnerable, people who cannot afford to own a private vehicle, persons who um, to rely on public health transportation, and those who lack cash. Early warning systems and contingency planning are only effective for people and communities to regular training and drills with their active participation. The sad reality is that some people easily forget risk and they often see natural hazards as dangerous that only threaten others. Even countries that are well prepared can do better. There is always room for improvement. And we have our final zone poll question for the evening. In your respective countries, which element of the early warning system needs more attention? And truthfully, there is really no right answer to this question. This is a question for you to just reflect on. And wherever your respective country may be in the early warning system, just do your part to pay more attention to it. And if there are other areas that also need attention, um, and use a step-by-step -step approach in order to make sure that at the end of the day, you have a comprehensive early warning system touching on all four elements. So in the Caribbean, there are a number of regional institutions and mechanisms supporting disaster risk reduction. This list is not comprehensive. So if you are a part of an entity that is not listed, I do apologize. The climate science community can play an important role in addressing public health challenges. Climate services for health are an emerging field of applied science 
defined as the entire iterative process of joint collaboration between relevant multidisciplinary partners to identify, generate, and build capacity to access, develop, deliver, and use relevant and reliable climate knowledge to enhance health decisions. In the Caribbean region, there is a regional consortium with the responsibility of designing, developing, and delivering actionable climate information products. Health is represented by CARFO, Tourism by the Caribbean Tourism Organization and the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, Agriculture by CARDI, Water by Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association, Disaster Risk Management by Sedema, and Climate by CIMH. I also want to highlight that these mechanisms are always at work. And the important take home message from this slide is that you are not alone. We stand united as a region. We must continue to be our brothers and sisters keep up. Though it is very easy to sink into a mindset that you are on an island in isolation. There are a lot of moving parts happening in the background that many of us simply do not see. As I reflect on my Hurricane Dorian experience, our main EOC in Nassau had regional representatives from Sedema and Paho working remotely and on the ground around the clock helping with this disaster. On the ground in Abaco, I can vividly remember when the doors of the emergency room opened and there standing was a US Coast Guard officer who arrived to airbag our most critical patients. My wife had two pediatric patients, two little girls, ages four and six. Their parents had just placed them into the car as their home was compromised by winds. And what happened next, you would never believe. The roof of the home flew off and landed on the car that they were just placed in. That was a harsh reality. And I'm so thankful that they were the first persons to come get off the island. And I can report that they are doing well. So climate change and vulnerability. Vulnerability is the tendency or predisposition to be adversely affected by climate-related health effects and encompasses three elements, exposure, sensitivity, or susceptibility to harm, and the capacity to adapt or to cope with change. Exposure is contact between a person and one or more biological, chemical, or physical stresses, include, including stresses affected by climate change. And then the contact may be a single time occurrence or repeatedly over time and may occur in one location or over a wider geographic area. Sensitivity is the degree to which populations or communities are affected, either adversely or beneficially by climate variability and change. The adaptive capacity is the ability of communities and institutions or people to adjust to potential hazards, to take advantage of opportunities or to respond to consequences. Professor Litchvel, I apologize, Prof, if I messed up the last name, spoke on this slide last week, but I also wanted to add a few more vulnerable populations to the diagram. And they are outdoor workers, pregnant women, immigrants, persons with chronic diseases and disabilities. And so if we look at the extremes of life, children are uniquely vulnerable to these changes. Their immature physiology and metabolism, incomplete development, higher exposure to air, food, and water per unit body weight, unique behavior patterns, and dependence on caregivers place children at much higher risk of climate-related health burdens than adults. It is estimated that 88% of the existing global burden of disease attributable to climate change occurs in children younger than five years of age. Climate change is currently affecting children through increased heat stress, decreased air quality, altered disease patterns of climate sensitive infections, physical and mental health effects of extreme weather events, and food insecurity in vulnerable regions. Extreme weather events directly harm children through injury and death. Again, the most common injuries after hurricane include lacerations, puncture wounds, and blunt trauma. The indirect effects of extreme weather on children are profound and far reaching. Children's biological and cognitive development occur in the context of family, school, neighborhoods, and communities. Disasters can cause irrevocable harm to children through devastation of this broader social context. And so what makes older people vulnerable? 
when we look at the statistics, the global population is aging. By 2050, one in five people globally will be 60 plus. It's not simply the frailty of old age that kills our mature citizens. Most deaths are consequences of environmental and social factors that the victims cannot overcome. In the case of Hurricane Katrina, two thirds of all the victims either drowned or died from illness or injuries brought about from being trapped in their houses surrounded by water. The remaining one third fell to injuries, infections, and other health conditions worsened by the difficult evacuation process. The physical wear and tear of evacuation can actually hasten the fatal effects of pre-existing health conditions like heart disease or weakened immune systems. Some frail older people seek medical care in local hospitals that have lost power and can't provide life-sustaining treatment like oxygen. The most tragic case occurred during 2017 Hurricane Irma, when 12 Florida nursing home residents ages 71 through 99 died of heat-related causes after the facility's air conditioning failed. Gender? Gender serves as an important dimension for both vulnerability and adaptation. That is whether and how women, men, boys, and girls are affected by and respond to climate change. The data shown on this slide comes from a 2016 research report on gender and climate change by Dr. Sam Sellers, who's, who is a climate change health researcher formerly based out of the University of Washington. His research was then commissioned by the Global Gender and Climate Alliance. And the results clearly demarcate the disproportionate disadvantage women find themselves in as it relates to climate change. An analysis of 130 peer-reviewed studies finds that women and girls often face disproportionately high health risks from impacts of climate change when compared to men and boys. The analysis showed that 68% of the 130 studies found that women were more affected by health impacts associated with climate change than their counterparts. The bar in the middle, bar chart in the middle shows the proportion of men and women affected by climate change impacts, including death and injury from extreme weather, food insecurity, infectious disease, mental illness, and poor reproductive and maternal health. It is clear to see that women are most impacted. And then the last diagram on the right hand side, 64% of females, which is about two thirds of the studies, found that women were more likely to suffer death or injury from extreme weather events. It is important to remember, however, that, that women are not only vulnerable to climate change, but they are also effective actors or agents of change in relation to both mitigation and adaptation. Women often have a strong body of knowledge and expertise that can be used in climate change mitigation, disaster reduction, and adaptation strategies. Furthermore, women's responsibilities in households and communities as stewards of natural and household resources position them well to contribute to livelihood strategies adapted to changing environmental realities. The IPCC report suggests that a child born today will be living in an environment that is more than four degrees warmer than the average temperature during the pre-industrial period and will experience significantly more frequent and intense environmental disasters, such as heat waves, wildfires, and hurricanes. Pregnant women and the growing fetus experience an extraordinary time with mainly tightly regulated physiologic and psychological changes. Any environmental negative impact during this sensitive period can have both immediate and lifelong consequences for both mother and offspring. However, research on health impacts of climate change and pregnancy outcomes is highly limited, contributing to the lack of consistent guidelines on how to adapt to and or mitigate climate impacts among pregnant women. In fact, pregnant women have only been recently added as a vulnerable group with respect to environmental exposures, such as air pollution and extreme heat. Despite challenges, concerted efforts for adaptation and mitigation should be continued and strengthened. First, educational efforts and resources to raise awareness will facilitate behavioral change 
and encourage public support for actions needed to reduce emissions and mitigate health impacts. Although climate change is generally known to the public, populations most impacted by its consequences have limited knowledge, power, and resources to mitigate its impact. Thus, it is pertinent that any adaptation mitigation efforts target these undeserved populations. Such efforts should also target healthcare professionals who through patient provider relationship can support vulnerability reduction strategies. A US survey of health professionals suggests that nearly 0% of OBGYN practitioners discuss environmental impacts of health with their patients. Data also shows that the majority of healthcare providers recognize the presence of climate change as a major threat to human health, but the lack of time, training, resources, and guidance are major barriers. Thus, provision of training, patient educational material, and clear policy guidance will empower healthcare providers to become a critical part in the health mitigation efforts. When we look at our outdoor workers, outdoor workers are often the first to be exposed to the effects of climate change. They may be exposed for longer durations and at greater intensities, which in the long run could result in the increased prevalence and severity of known occupational hazards and exposures, and also the emergence of new ones. And so when we think about the, the profile of our outdoor workers, let's remember our, our farmers, our agricultural workers, fishermen, because the entire region thrives and is supported heavily by our blue economy, construction workers, paramedics, firefighters, police, and other first responders. And so in conclusion, Spencer Kimball said, preparedness when properly pursued is a way of life, not a sudden spectacular program. Climate change is not a distant threat. It's a growing reality. The harsh reality is that we in the Caribbean are not exempt from climate change. Extreme weather events such as hurricane profiles have changed. We must continue to create a regional body of literature because it is our own local data which will drive decision-making. Knowledge does not apply itself. We as individuals must make the application and the application consists in fertilizing the thought with a living purpose. So I challenge the 341 of us on this call tonight to reflect on what we have done or what we could have done since the last hurricane to improve the landscape around us, whether it be on an individual, community, or institutional level. Remember, when disaster strikes, the time to prepare has passed. And so I would like to just throw in a plug for Code Green, Disaster Preparedness in the Era of Climate Change, which is a conference I'm putting on April 25th and 26th. So if you're interested, you can reach out to the email below or reach out to Dr. James Hospitalis. And finally, I would like to show you what good public health communication looks like through this video. Hello world, especially for those of you in the Caribbean, the match is about to start. We are a team. We are prepared. These are the fighters. My Caribbean brothers and sisters, from June 1st to November, prepare now, not after, prepare now, not later. Don't wait for disaster to show love to your neighbor. It's hurricane season. Come on. Hurricanes are coming. City safe shelter. Check up on the latest news. Disaster fighters. Na 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 na. Let's do this together now. Hurricane fighters. We got fight to make it better. Ah, uh, when the hazards coming, we should tell each other. This is the time for us to prepare together. Look out for your neighbor. Make sure the children safe. And with this team training lives, we go to save. Flashlights, check. Food and water, check. Your trendy trees, check. 
check on the elderly. Check your neighbor and your friend them. Uh-huh. Wear your mask to protect them. Uh-huh. Check the news to inform them. Or else you might end up in a problem. I'm free. Free. Thank you very much. I'm going to entertain questions. Over to you, Cecilia. Fantastic. Thank you so much, William. I'm wondering if you could maybe stop. Oh, perfect. Um, wonderful. That was an incredible presentation. I mean, so much rich information, and I think everyone learned a lot. Um, thank you for sticking around for questions. Um, to our audience, you, if you have questions for Dr. Hamilton, please put them in the chat and we'll get started. So the first question we have, Dr. Hamilton, is uh, the question as to whether there are still actions we can take to prevent the severity of storms, which you mentioned are increasing under a warming climate. Yeah, so when we look at that, I think that we have to think about it. First, when you look at your country, right? And we can, I, and I usually like to do things in a systematic approach. So I have a look at it, government, community, individual, and from a government standpoint, I think that the region, we're now starting to get more engaged in climate change related matters. And so policy actions from the top are important. So I always talk about a top down approach and then a bottom up approach, because, you know, sometimes persons get wary of all of the policy changes from government. But also now we try to get into the schools and the communities, because I often say sitting around a dining room table having lunch with your kids and your kid says, mommy, we need to stop driving to school every day. Maybe we should walk or ride a bike. You know, these things are what really stick with parents and adults and make us start to do these behavioral changes that would need to come about. Thanks so much. And I couldn't agree more. You know, they say every degree, every point of a degree of warming um, it is matters, right? And so anything we can do now within our capacity to decrease greenhouse gas emissions is worth it, right? It's it's not a too late situation. It's that every everything we can do now is, is going to help prevent the future of having you know, more severe storms. The next question I wanted to ask Dr. Hamilton is that you know, a lot of people on this call are health professionals who care directly for communities and individuals. And you talked a lot about mental health impacts. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the mental health impacts of health workers, you know, people who are seeing the trauma, seeing um, you know, so many people being affected and suffering. And is there any, been any research on this, looking at how health professionals are affected um, you know, by extreme weather events in and of themselves? Absolutely. There is a lot of research out there on it. I think that we actually need to do a little bit more on it. And I think what has happened is that COVID-19 has pretty much lit a fire on mental health, especially with the burnout rates in healthcare providers. And so I don't, I can look it up and get back to you with some actual um, papers on it. I don't have that on the at the top of my head, but I definitely know there is a lot of research being done on it right now, especially COVID and climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. The next question is from Jonathan Bratt, and he's asking, you know, what are your own personal reflections on Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas? How has the country coped 
in the aftermath of such a, a severe storm? So thank you for that question. I think that as a country, we are still trying, we're still trying to get back to where we were. And I don't, and getting back to where we were, I don't, I think that's a bad way to look at it because we have to build back better and stronger than we were. And so I think what has happened is again, not blaming everything on COVID, but COVID honestly has had a major impact on the economics of many countries and the Bahamas is one that has also felt the brunt of it. And so a lot of resources that could have gone towards building back the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama, that, finance, that funding would have now been turned to COVID-19. So I think that from a healthcare standpoint, uh, we have done a lot of work, one, to build capacity, human resources, making sure that you know the clinics are retrofitted and prepared. And we're currently doing an assessment on our hurricane shelters um, to make sure that, because uh, we don't have designated shelters. Most countries don't. We usually use like a school or, you know, some donated building from the private community. And so we just need to make sure that we're looking at every aspect of preparedness, right? Because disaster management is a big circle. I call it almost like the circle of life. And so preparedness is the first part of it. And that's not something that we can take like or overlook. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's a question here of, you know, there, you know, could there have been, you know, some type of system-wide failure in response when it came to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas? But I think, you know, the larger question that's being asked is how can how can the Caribbean better prepare their systems to respond to this increasing severity of storms that we're seeing? And I'd love to hear what you think about that, Dr. Hamilton, and then also maybe what Dr. Hospitalis could add to that from his experience. Mm -hmm. So where what went wrong so when i went again my reflection i think that we we took things very lightly right mm -hmm. and so when i spoke to many of my counterparts on the ground in abaco the talk on the ground is guys it's just another hurricane it's just it's, it's, we had a hurricane category five hurricane hurricane floyd passed through and we survived so it was like a, almost like a nonchalant laissez-faire type of approach and when it hit, they were like, oh my God, I'll never stay on the island again, right? And so though measures were put in place um, from a government standpoint, making sure that you know, resources were there, I think we now need to make sure that we look at the mindset of our communities and empower our communities with the knowledge and the tools. Because being an island nation with 700 islands and keys, there's no way for us to have all the resources on every island all the time, because again, economics is something that is always considered. So we need to find ways to decentralize information from the capital to ensure that those in the South have the necessary tools in order to be able to respond until help comes. And so I'd love to have Dr. Hospital's input on it as well. That's wonderful, James. Well, uh, William, I, you know, I think it's it's really interesting. You know, I think one of the lessons that we've been learning again and again with climate change is that we can't base our preparedness for the future based on experience from the past, right? I mean, we say that always with like with wildfires. It's just another wildfire. We've had plenty of them, or it's another storm. But what we're seeing with climate change is that it's not just another storm. This is a climate fueled storm. So I'll turn it over to uh, to Dr. Hospitalis. It's, uh, thanks a lot, Cecilia. Thanks, William. Great talk. Um, I was on the Caribbean disaster response team in the late 80s and 90s, uh, so I responded to many hurricanes, and the behavior of hurricanes has changed. Why is that? Early in your talk, you pointed to what was happening with rising temperatures and heat, and we're all concerned about that, and the world is focused, you know, try to stay to 1.5 to stay alive. But most of the heat actually is in the oceans, 80 to 90% of the extra heat that humans produce is in the oceans. And so that heat is able to power storms that are stronger, wetter, intensify faster, and move slower, and last longer. So Hurricane Matthew is the longest lived category four or five storm on record. It touched the OECS countries, the Eastern Caribbean. It, it hit the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, and then it turned north and hit Haiti, 
hit Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, and it devastated parts of the Carolinas. And that's an example of, we cannot just think, oh, it's just another one because they're behaving differently. Dorian sat over the Bahamas for more than 24 hours. That had never happened before. So that word, unprecedented, never happened before, never seen this before. We gotta get, that. That is that is what's gonna keep happening. So you gotta get caught if you just think, oh, this is just as normal. Um, so, so, so that issue of wetter, hotter, stronger, intensifying faster, we've got to wake up to that reality or we're really going to get slam dunked. Thanks so much for that, for that input, James. And, and this is a huge wake up call. Um, we have a question here from Ms. Smith. Are there any ministries of health in the region that you know of that are including climate impacts or an element of climate and health? in their work, for example, in their patient assessments uh, and their screening for outdoor workers or frontline workers? Are any Caribbean ministries of health doing work in this space that you know of? Great question. Unfortunately, I am not sure. I think Dr. Hospitalis might have a little bit more insight on that than me. James? Thanks again, William. You know, I think for years, people have been focused on uh, climate and the economy. What's it going to do to tourism? What's it going to do to finances? What's it going to do to fisheries, agriculture? It's only more recently that there's a waking up. This is a really serious health issue. And so you saw last year, 200 medical journals getting together, unprecedented, to write an editorial that said climate is the biggest public health threat of the 21st century. And I would say ministries of health are coming to, to wake up to this. There are more uh, climate uh, health national adaptation plans led by Pan American Health. And I think what you just asked is going to be creeping in more that people will start asking questions about uh, the, the climate contribution to some of these health issues and climate screening questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's on us as health professionals to, to sound the alarm, right, to start saying we need to be doing things differently because you know, we are seeing the impacts happening in our practice. The next question here is from Christopher Singh. He asks, how equipped is Bahamas to tackle other disasters brought upon by climate change? For examples like drought or floods or food security, is there, is there any work going on in the Bahamas in that space? Yes, there is work going on. Unfortunately, that's not my um, preview but I have heard being a part of the climate change circle of things that are being implemented. However, that's something that I have been stressing now that we need to move away from just thinking of hurricanes as the only hazard that will affect the country. And I always harp on developing an all hazards approach because honestly with Hurricane Dorian no longer being a one in 100 year kind of storm to now a five to 10 year kind of storm, the same principle could apply now to us seeing other types of extreme weather events or just climate change related events in general. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, just to foreshadow our next session, uh, next week we'll be hearing from Celia Poon King from PAHO, who will be talking about weather and food related illness related to drought and flooding in the Caribbean. So I think we'll get some more questions answered there as well. Uh, the next question is from Jonathan Bratt. He asks, are there any studies that indicate a correlation between the areas, regions most impacted by climate change and increased cases of mental health uh, complications or impacts? Sorry, I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> uh, Jonathan, I didn't come across any in my reading preparing for this talk. But again, Cecilia, if you could uh, just group these questions, I'll be more than happy to find it out and uh, get the responses back to them. Yeah, absolutely. And in my experience, you know, what I've seen is, is there are case studies that are done in the aftermath of climate related events, which are documenting, you know, increases in mental health needs and so on and so forth. But I'm not sure if there's been an aggregate study to really look at all, all climate impacts and all mental health outcomes. But, you know, I would say for many of the exposures that we talk about in terms of extreme events, we, we absolutely do see cascading mental health burdens where it has been studied. Um, so uh, yeah, there is, there is, there is some, some literature there, that, although I don't know if we have that aggregate that, that you were asking about. Um, Celia, next, if, I can, yeah. if I can comment, one of the mental health issues that I saw after many disasters is uh, aggression. Mm -hmm. violence, uh, looting. After Hurricane uh, 
Maria in Dominica, the chief medical officer said the looting was as bad again as the hurricane uh, because your normal checks and balances in society have been removed. People are afraid uh, and you get more aggressive behavior. And I think that's something that our security groups within CARICOM need to pay more attention to and be aware that after a, a, a major event, you're likely to have more of this sort of civil unrest and aggression to deal with. And I think that is part of the spectrum of mental health problems following a major climate event over. Absolutely. And as Dr. Hamilton mentioned, you know, we see disproportionate impacts on, on women following extreme events. And one of those is is domestic violence. We know that domestic violence cases soar in the aftermath of climate related disasters. And it's something that we often um, aren't really quite able to, to address because again, it's sort of like people are doing other things. You know, there was a lot of, um, this came to a head in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, where, you know, there were tons of, of situations of domestic violence, but the folks who were normally tasked with dealing with that were out doing other things like directing traffic and, and working in other areas. And so oftentimes, you know, we see that women's health is not prioritized in the aftermath of climate related disasters and that can exacerbate mental health impacts as well as physical health impacts. So um, just more, more things we need to have our eyes on as health professionals, I would say. The next question is, ah, can you please share any experience or plans you have to engage or train community health workers in preparedness response as part of your workforce? Great question. And actually, we are in the process of trying to get that underway currently. And so we are putting together a team um, to get that moving. And um, not to answer your question directly, I'll answer it indirectly, that we have started to look at implementing climate change and health modules into the medical school curriculum here locally in the Bahamas. And so I think that once we see how that works, we will try to extrapolate certain components from that to make it um, user-friendly for community workers. Because again, I think if we empower the community, there, will, there won't be such a heavy reliance on, oh, just running to the doctor. You know, if I know first aid or CPR, I could at least start the ball rolling and tell a health professional or a disaster management preparedness team can come in to provide assistance. Absolutely. That's wonderful to hear, you know, these efforts are underway. And I think, you know, we all can see how, how, how much they're needed. And that's wonderful to hear. Next question. Uh, you know, it's really, I think, about, about communication, and it's a question that is, how do we intercept cultural norms for preparation? Bahamians do tend to prepare late, but even employers of large corporations tend not to help financially to provide people the opportunity to purchase medications and supplies until the hurricane is 24 to 48 hours away. So how, how do we intercept this? I'm just curious to hear your, your thoughts on that. So Cecilia, you're saying, how do we intercept? Uh, repeat it one more time for me, Sonclair. Yeah, how do we intercept the cultural norms for preparation? You know, there's always this, this thing like, oh, okay, now the storm's coming, okay. Mm -hmm. And then you run to the food store, but there's no more water because everyone's running to the food store, right? Mm -hmm. How do we intercept that thinking? And how do we create new norms around this? Absolutely. So again, the unfortunate thing are a lot of behavior change modifications happen with experience. So it'll be very interesting to see after having such a, Hurricane Dorian experience, if we will still have this reactive approach, one. And then two, I think that our public health communication on hurricanes need to be all year round. Yeah, because usually we start our talks and beefing up our ex exposures on the community. I mean, and it's on the TV and the radios when hurricane season is literally two, two days away. And I think we need to be hammering the message home until people get tired of hearing it that you need to prepare, you need to prepare. And if you start early in advance, I mean, we save and prepare for what we want to, right? If we're going to prom or we're graduating, we get our hair done, we get our nails done, we save for that. And I, the same efforts that should we do to these other things that may seem trivial, we need to do to the bigger things that are, could actually have a detrimental impact on life. 
Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we think about is, you know, how can clinicians be engaged in this? In the U.S. where I practice, you know, primary care doctors ask patients always, you know, are you safe at home? Um, do you have guns in your home and are they locked? And do you wear your seatbelt? You know, and I think, you know, we can have the fourth question of, are you prepared for the next hurricane? And what does that look like, right? You know, having the type of literature, that type of messaging happening within the healthcare setting can perhaps also sort of help drive home this message. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much for your response there. Uh, the next question is from Miss Hyde. She says, I realize locally in Jamaica, many people are hesitant to go to emergency shelters due to their poor conditions, which hampers the success of emergency response. Are there any research or plans in place on a regional level to improve shelters that you're aware of? Great question. I am not aware of anything on a regional level, um, but I will say what is being, what's happening locally in the Bahamas. After our assessment, uh, we are now crafting a term called climate resilient shelters. And so what that means is that it's going to be sustainable. It's going to be we're considering it a green prototype, it's going to be resilient, all right? And I think uh, another question that has come up a lot as it relates to shelters is how do we now ensure that our shelters are COVID friendly? Because during this COVID season, imagine if we had a hurricane in 2020, and I'm pretty sure nobody would have wanted to go to a shelter due to, you know, oh my gosh, will I get COVID, yeah? So it's important that we we take a look at uh, from a healthcare standpoint how we can ensure that we re we relay messages to our community to tell them that it's still safe to go to the shelter even in this environment. So making sure that we have adequate ventilation, isolation rooms, and the challenging thing with shelters is that these buildings are usually not government owned. And so there's no way that you can prepare a church hall and tweak it to the modifications that you need. So now you need to come in on the spot and try to make do with the resources that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. The next question is from Stacy Alvarez de la Campa. She asks, are there any specific socioeconomic and or health concerns among indigenous populations, especially those in the Caribbean, that must be taken into account during disaster preparedness? I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, and so I will piggyback off of one of my colleagues out of Suriname who's currently doing some work with the indigenous community there. And I think um, the socioeconomic factors are something that she's considering. However, it is knowing the what I call the lay of the land, right? Because if you don't speak to the, the, the correct chief or you know the person in charge, even if you have the world of information, the world, the world of experience, nobody will listen, right? So it's knowing the chain of command. Once and once you speak to, to the person in charge, that person now pretty much becomes that advocate for you in order to relate the message to the community in order to get action to happen. And Dr. Hospitalis, I don't know if you want to chime in based off of your experience. Thanks, William. Well, very often people, indigenous people are going to be in part of the, the, the socioeconomic system where they're poorer and they may have uh, housing that's not as robust and or they may be living in places that are, that are more vulnerable, close to a river or close to a storm surge area. So that does have to be taken into account uh, in preparation. And some countries do that. On the other hand, two indigenous populations can be part of the solution. They often have a knowledge about agriculture and crops that are more uh, adaptable or, or uh, more adapted to our situation instead of imported crops, with knowledge of when to plant uh, and so on. So I think they, they, they are more vulnerable and need a particular attention, and they also can be part of the solution. Great. Thank you both for that. The next question is around mental health impacts following disasters. Uh, there's a, a thought that you know people may be hesitant to receive mental health care. Maybe people who have it before, but who are affected, you know, even months out. You know, how can this be dealt with? How can we, you know, 
maybe normalize these impacts that we know are happening psychologically? Have, have there, has there been any research or any efforts underway um, to do that? Yeah, I think, uh, Cecilia, to that question, I think the there's a stigma surrounding mental health in general, right? Yeah, not just only related to hurricanes or extreme weather events. And I think, again, these type of forums and uh, continuing to educate our people that it's okay to have depression, it's okay to have post-traumatic stress disorder, because you will be surprised the number of high-functioning people in society that have their own mental health challenges, but they're still able to function because they're seeking help. And so we need to remove the stigma and the shame associated with it and make people realize it's okay to seek help. And I think one thing, a barrier, especially in small islands is that I go to the psychiatrist or the, psych or the psychologist, and then I hear that, oh, Dr. Hamilton has anxiety from my neighbor, right? And so it's always that challenge that should I go Will my information not stay confidential? And so as healthcare providers, we need to ensure, even if we're using our patients as case studies to get a point across, that we don't give out too, inf too much information because then it's difficult now to circle back that patient and bring them back to say, it's okay to still come and speak to me on a topic. Yeah, absolutely. And confidentiality is just so essential to providing, you know, reliable mental health care that people trust. So thank you for that. We have time for one last question, which is how can we encourage a nation to reduce its ecological footprint in an effort to reduce our contribution to the negative health impacts of climate change? Great question, because as you know, as a region, our greenhouse gas emissions are like 0.0. 1%, but that doesn't mean that we still shouldn't do our part, right? And so it's funny enough, I was just talking to a friend of mine whose car went down and he took it upon himself now to ride a bicycle to work. Never heard of in the Bahamas if you ask me, right? Because everybody owns a vehicle. So there's certain little things that we can do. And I think once we as a community start to show that we're taking it more seriously, um, then you would see more actions even from our uh, the government because every road built now should have a bike lane, right? You know, we should start supporting more of our local products. Uh, we shouldn't be importing, importing products that are locally grown. So there's certain little things that can be done. And we also need to think about the co-benefits. You know, my friend riding his bike to work. I mean, his cardiovascular health is amazing. He's losing weight. You know, he's not burning a bunch of fossil fuels. So, I mean, when we look at it from a holistic picture, I think it's fantastic switching out our buses to, you know, electric or hybrid type of equip uh, uh, vehicles are other ways that we can try to continue to mitigate our impacts uh, on climate change from a greenhouse gas emission perspective. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful session. I'm, I'm so grateful for you being here, Dr. Hamilton, and sharing all your wisdom and all your experience um, in the work that you do. I'm so inspired by all the participants and the great conversations and sharing of ideas and resources in the chat. Um, it's just so wonderful to have everybody here today. A couple more quick reminders. The link is in the chat right now for the skills and practice session, which is happening next Tuesday. And then next Wednesday, we're gonna have a talk from Dr. Celia Poon King, who will be speaking about water and food related issues as, as climate change impacts them. So we look forward to seeing you all next week. Please feel free to reach out to us anytime if you have questions and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Take care. <laughs>